host for today's Weekdays Live. And we started over because I was getting feedback. We weren't getting sound. Hopefully you're getting sound today. And uh, today it's sort of an overview of a whole lot of different issues. And turns out, who knew? They're all connected. I tell you, when we started um, fighting against foreclosures uh, 18 months ago, significantly fighting. I mean, websites and, you know, town halls and things like that. I had no idea that this is where we'd end up. And yet, you know, it makes total sense because as we have fought for foreclosures and heard William K. Black talking about 10,000 felonies a month and, you know, started to explore all of these issues, now we see how it's totally interconnected. And that's what we're doing today. Today, we're going to take off our rose-colored glasses and we're going to face full on what we really are in because then we can understand how to get out if we don't know where we're at if we keep telling ourselves things that aren't true then we can't have successful solutions i mean they may be partially successful but what we really want are is the ability to actually understand grasp and then we can move forward as a group and, like I said yesterday, we can connect with our family and friends. Because one a day, if we just keep exposing it. Here's the point. Something I'm going to show you today, this was like 12 years ago. This was in 2001. And I didn't know about it. You didn't know about it. None of us knew about it. But it's happening. And so now we've connected some of these things. You know, there's so many people, so many things going on. We're all focused on our own little worlds. So um, I want to just bring a lot of these things to your attention. Just a second. I got to write this quickie email um, uh, to Gail. And um, there we go. Okay. So what I'd first start like to talk about is the a couple of issues that other you know that conflicts with things that we've been told we've been told when housing recovers everything is going to be fine and here's an article that just says mm, don't think so so simply because the housing prices recover like we've talked about before it may give the in in mindset the ambiance of wealth but as you and I both know personally from people we know, ourselves, others, it's not the people that are getting wealthy on housing anymore. It's, it's the ultra wealthy. And as we're going to see before today's show is over, that was the whole plan. It was the plan. It has always been the plan, uh, probably before some of us were born. So that's a little disheartening. But like I said, we're going to take the classes off and we're going to make sure that we see clearly. Here's another um, article I wanted to bring to your attention as a prelude to the bond market and the Federal Reserve. This guy's writing right now that there are dynamics in place for a bear market. And a bear market is not a good thing for <laughs> the people. <laughs> so here's the... Um, I'm telling you, I feel like computers are ganging up on me. <laughs> okay, so uh, the point is that we need to plan and prepare that things are not going to be rosy, and it could happen this year. Here's the issue with the Fed. The Fed, Federal Reserve, has more than a $3 trillion bond portfolio, and there are some issues that uh, people want to know, the House Republicans in this particular case, are asking for some documents from the Federal Reserve to explain how the Federal Reserve is going to wind down their bond portfolio without ruining the economy. And if that sounds fascinating to you like it does to me, here's another article which actually points out that it's not possible it is not possible for the Fed to wind down the bond portfolio or to even actually stop purchasing bonds itself without collapsing the economy. And that is the problem. 
So, so here you've got, you know, the little quote that these, these senators are upset because they're frustrated at the lack of response. Hey, hey, we want some information from the Fed. Why aren't they giving it to us? But like the article points out, well, the Fed can't. Because if the Fed stops quantitative easing, which is purchasing the bonds, that'll make home prices go down. If the interest rate goes up, it makes our debt, the interest on the debt, explode. And so the fact of the matter is there isn't any elegant way out. And that is part of the issue. Listen to this. The U.S. Treasury market. It is the most overpriced, overowned, oversupplied market in the history of global economics. We know that yields are at record lows. If you go in back, to, uh, looking at the 10-year note, it is 550 basis points below its 40-year average. We, have, we all know there's a record amount of bond fund inflows since the uh, Great Recession began in December of 2007. And the publicly traded debt is up $7 trillion since this Great Recession began. That's an increase of 140% in five years. This is a classic bubble. It's the biggest in history. It's more dangerous than any other bubble ever before. And when it bursts, it's going to take out the global economy. Okay, so it doesn't sound good on paper, right? But in reality, isn't betting against the bond market kind of like betting against the Fed? And we've all realized that, that can be a pretty dangerous thing to do. Well, okay, well, there's two catalysts that can burst this bond, this bond bubble. One is Fed-induced and one is market-driven. Now, let's suppose for some miracle, after five years of trying, there's a, a huge surge in the money multiplier effect, and the economy suddenly heals, and we have a massive dose of inflation. Wouldn't you think the Fed would have to, you know, end QE and then and then unwind their balance sheet? The end of the the end of this year, their balance sheet, sheet will be close to four trillion dollars. That alone will pop the bond bubble. Oh, and now that's that's really encouraging. Are you hearing that? She says it doesn't sound good. He's talking about a meltdown in the economy. Now, here's something else I wanted to point out, and that is we are living in a world of tweet rumors. And in this, this was a false, you probably maybe heard about it. This was a hacked tweet, and but it came out, said that the White House had had um, some... Uh, explosions and it injured President Obama and the trouble with this I mean it's bad enough that they they're hacking the tweet but here's the problem the market impact was intense the Dow plunged more than 140 points and bond yields fell and this was based on one tweet so for several minutes there's a flurry of activity, and they're talking about a temporary loss of market cap in the S&P 500 alone was $136 billion. I'm telling you, we are living on the edge. When one tweet, now this, I think Syria, some, you know, um, terrorists have hacked into the, the situation, but here's the point. One, they could. Two, they did. Three, it worked, and four, in what, just a few seconds, a few minutes, the market loses $136 billion. And then, of course, you know, after five minutes or so, it came back. But that isn't the point, is it? The point is that this whole planet, our whole system, is could be literally just blown over with a puff. <sighs> There's a, there's a tweet. <laughs> Blew it down with a tweet. We don't need bombs anymore. All we need is to hack the tweets. This is, this is truly a dangerous situation. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And then here again, um, here's another interconnection that is literally dangerous. I just want to point out how volatile and our markets are, and how dangerously interconnected they are, and how they are basically computerized. Listen to how, listen to this guy. This is about the yen. This is about our currencies.
Welcome back to Squawk on the Street. Today for the Santelli Exchange, we're going to do a little post-mortem on yesterday's AP fake tweet, or as I like to call it, the kind of uh, two-minute flash crash. You know, when everything in the world... What, Computer trading. Everything can move with a button. One button, you know? One button. You can change everything. Therefore, all stimulus is fungible. You've heard me say that many times. Now, when we look at what happened yesterday, many are going to point to all the very important issues. And in about 30 minutes, we'll have Joe Saluzzi talking about HFT. But I want to talk about something much more simple. Okay, if at that point yesterday, around 1 Eastern, you looked at stocks, of course, you saw that, boom, we had one of these, okay? But if you looked at the euro currency against the dollar, you didn't see it. If you looked at the pound, the British pound, GP. P, the symbol on some of the computers, you didn't see it. If you looked at the Aussie dollar, you didn't see it. But where you did see this exact same pattern was any of the cross trades that involved the Japanese yen. So whether it was the dollar, the yen, the euro yen, the pound yen, anything yen, you had the exact same pattern. Now let's think about it. Computerized trading takes place, boom, like that. You already missed half of it, just in the snap of a finger. So obviously there was no thought going into this. It's algorithmically programmed in. So what am I making such a big deal about? Think about it. They didn't think, traders, oh, hey, it's time to do. The yen is now programmed into the equity algorithms that are trading on the high-speed computers. And that is very important. We talked about how the carry trade first step was to basically borrow yen at low interest rates. What is the long and short of borrowing yen? A short position. So when equities move, Dollar yen, euro yen, pound yen are going to move and vice versa. So if you really want to know what's going on in the world of stimulus, keep an eye on anything related to the yen. David Faber and Carl, back to you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Santelli. Okay. Did you hear that? That is the point, isn't it? The, he is making a classic case that we are, that all stimulus is fungible which basically means that all just could disappear in the blink of an eye. And he's saying that now they've connected, the yen is now connected to algorithmic trading. So, so I'm telling you, it's not the people that are going to blow this up. It's the computers. <laughs> it, 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 it's truly mind boggling to me how, um, how risky the system has become and how how basically we're just sitting ducks we're ducks in the pot and we're going to be swept along that's why we're taking off the glasses at least we can understand this and it's not if you will necessarily evil that somebody's going to do this to us we've been doing this to ourselves so to speak not you and me of course but the powers that be and that is the point that it is about the money, it is about how, how they can manipulate the market, it is about how it is going to come down on our heads. The sky is going to fall, but you know, we will be there to move out of the way as best we can and pick up the pieces and have a new spring. That's, that's just a classic, um, the way things work, <laughs> you know, summer, fall, winter, spring. Now, I did want to bring to your attention some other battles that are forming. So here we've got the SEC, which um, wants to disclose, force the disclosure of corporations to disclose to the shareholders all of their political donations. And of course, this is an effort supported by the people to transform the growing world of secret campaign spending. And it's fascinating to me. I just read about this the first thing in the paper this morning, so I came to find the links. And it's so interesting. Who is fighting? Because who is fighting back? The Chamber of Commerce. And they op oppose the disclosure rules for political contributions. They're going to make up all kinds of reasons. And I was struggling to figure out why. What do they have to do with it? Well, it turns out 
that they have not political action committees, but they have trade organizations that educate. It's all about the words, isn't it? And so they get tons of money to educate the people in support of business and the corporations. So I, I just call it, you know, sort of like a hidden pack, in, in my opinion. That's my opinion. And that is just amazing. Who knew? Now I know. Now you know. Now we can help others know. This is the point. We got to see the world the way it is. Fascinating. A little disappointing. But, you know, not completely overwhelming because, let me tell you, we have the boots. We have the boots. We just have to get the boots on the ground. Now, here's something else I wanted to bring out. This is sort of just out of left field, but it really struck me because this guy had actually discovered an error in a, in a research paper. And this is, uh, they call it a growth debt nexus. And the fact is, these economists do this research and they publish these papers. And it turns out that huge worldwide policy decisions are made on these findings. And then what this guy discovered was, hey, the guy made a mistake on the Excel spreadsheet. Kid you not. They made an error on their spreadsheet. So the conclusions they came to were faulty. And yet now we've got, see, last Friday's G20 meetings told me that the error was a factor in their decision to omit specific deficit or debt to GDP targets in the G20 communique. So, so <laughs> it, it, it's Pretty, pretty amazing to me, but I guess it's the natural and logical thing, way things work when the whole planet trusts some information that then turns out to be, oh, oops, I'm telling you, we're just really on the edge and we need to understand that and we need to be prepared for that. Now, I did want to t point out about uh, foreclosures. This is Golden State for California. And the starts are the lowest since 2005, they claim. I can't argue with the numbers. They're counting these numbers and have track of all this information. But what I don't like is the assumptions that are made in this article. And I was contacted by the Marin Independent um, Journal, the IJ, yesterday. Uh, a reporter there asking me for some, you know, feedback about the numbers. And I was really pleased for that because it gave me a chance to actually offer some feedback. And the thing I wanted to point out is this, this writer, you know, other than just citing the facts of foreclosures, he says rising home prices will be key to the final mop up of the foreclosure mess. As values rise, fewer people owe more than their homes are worth and more people can refi into more favorable loans. It also means more who fall on hard times can sell their homes for enough to pay off the loan. And of course, I objected to virtually every one of those statements because the foreclosure mess is not really related to rising home prices, particularly since the initial prices were like double where they're at and rising prices maybe five or even 10% higher. It's not even close to where they were. And the fact is people are selling their homes short right and left. So they don't have to sell their homes for enough to pay off the loan. And when they sell their homes short, how does that really help the real estate market? So the, they just say a lot of stuff and it's not really connected. And most people don't understand that. And so they just swallow it and say, oh, well, that's good. And of course, they talk about um, foreclosure, foreclosure starts are trending down because of rising home prices. Uh, no, because rising home prices has nothing to do really with people defaulting. People default for a variety of reasons, but typically they lost income. And so just because the neighbor's house rises doesn't mean that the foreclosure isn't going to start on your loan if you've stopped paying. So I was able to at least express some of those opinions. I have not seen any article that was supposed to come out today. So if they quoted me on something, I'll let you know. Nevertheless, good for you for paying attention and watching and spreading the good word. Now, 
Uh, this is a doctrine I wanted to talk about. This is another article, and this is now specifically related to foreclosure defense. And this article is fairly discouraging because it cites repeated uses in a variety of different courts. We'll scan through it real quickly, but I wanted to summarize first that the judges are basically saying, okay, the person borrowed, they didn't pay, you can't get the house for free, you have unclean hands, you've stopped paying, so you should lose the house. You So, for example, in some of these highlighted spots down here, it says, uh, they failed to pay the debt as agreed, then sought judicial assistance in avoiding this contractual obligation. The doctrine of unclean hands applies to close the doors to equitable relief, such as quiet title. So people are uh, owners that are pursuing, uh, obviously in this case, a quiet title action, um, they're being denied because of these issues, because of the unclean hands doctrine. And it's, it, it's fairly discouraging, but on the other hand, I want to remind you that it's based on the claims, the pleadings that are done in the lawsuit, which we do not see and we don't have access to. I, I, I'm sure somebody that knew how to look them up could find them. But nevertheless, see, it, when, when this statement states it is undisputed that plaintiffs defaulted on their mortgage loan over four years ago, they seek to declare the mortgage invalid after defaulting. As such, they came to the present case with unclean hands. It's all about the pleadings. It really is. It's all about the pleadings. And obviously, those pleadings didn't work. It's basically the pleadings that are working, that we've been finding out about, are those that say, yes, Your Honor, borrowed the money but he's trying to foreclose and i don't even know who he is i borrowed from this from somebody else and so who is this guy that's trying to foreclose he needs to prove that i owe him something because that is the truth whoever these people and all of these cases are the same whoever they borrowed from was not the entity foreclosing not if it was a securitized loan and you and i both know that so even though you read some of these articles and can feel a little discouraged, it's not over yet. It's not over yet, and we're working on a good legal solution for the people. And by the way, I did want to um, mention here, um, evidently, and I want to bring up this um, uh, email, from one of, one of our followers. Evidently, and this is one thing I, I really can't do while I'm sh casting the show, and that is watching the live stream comments. And so a lot of people are there commenting back and forth about different solutions and things that might work. And uh, I've got some you know really good uh, viewers that have taken it on themselves to address these issues, check them out. And the, the whole point is that it's it's really important that everyone focus on d doing their own due diligence and asking others to help them do that due diligence rather than just rushing off and, and making a decision. And part of the problem is nobody knows who to ask. That's been a major problem. People will say to me, well, do you have an attorney, you know, that can help me? And I'm like, uh... <laughs> Uh, where are you and who? Because there's so few that really have been successful. And so um, what uh, Ronald writes, he said, uh, you know, that he, he's recommending that I thank everybody I do, and I do thank you from my heart that you're watching, that you're sharing, that you're interacting. But I also have the word of caution that a lot of times people are expressing theories, and if you've listened to any, many of my live streams, somebody will say, blah, 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 and of course I come back. That's really fascinating, and it's probably true, but how does that help people keep their homes? And that is the question everybody has to constantly keep in mind. Theories are great, um, but how can that actually stop a foreclosure? How does it postpone the auction? How does it get that owner to keep the home? Because that is the point. And this is what um, 
Ronald is saying. He said, this is no time to make social change or theorize or to pontificate as to how things should be. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, that's what we all want, but we have to constantly say, you know, if, if you or people you know and you're working with are trying to save the home, then focus on that. That is job one. And they, you must deal with things the way they are right now the law with the way it is, the rules with the way they are, and each person must do their own due diligence, Ron writes. Uh, remember last week, he's reminding us that Dr. Carmella was shocked that she was defrauded by an attorney, even though he had no license to practice in Colorado. And and here's the part of the problem. The, the people, you and I, we, we don't know what questions to ask. That's the lack of education and we can turn right around and look at the way we are fed the media, the way we are told things, the things we don't study in school, the things our kids aren't studying in school. And, and these are things that need to be changed also. We need to teach our children and ourselves to think and to try to figure out what questions to ask particularly in an environment like this where everybody's just been thrown into the foreclosure pot, okay? You've just been dumped in there and everyone's going, wait a minute, I want to keep my house and that can't be right and this isn't right and I'm supposed to, these people are supposed to tell me the truth and then they aren't. So now what can I do? And so this is part of the effort that we're going through together to try to bring that truth and that understanding to the people. Thanks, Ron, for writing that. Oh, yes. He, one more thing. Uh, Ronald writes, uh, Ronald Reagan said it all in three words. Trust, but verify. And, and I've tried to say that, too, on my website. I've given some warnings. You know, if people say you got to pay me to do a loan mod, watch out. Trust, but verify, verify, verify. And truly, if you have a question, email me. I can often forward it to somebody else that can answer the question because I can't answer every question. Not yet. I'm working on it. All right. I wanted to bring to your attention that yesterday was the judgment for Doc X. Now, this is an article from February. It's the last article that's been published. And I emailed John O'Brien's office uh, last night to saying, hey, did you guys get some settlement from Doc X? What's happened? And they had to say they don't have any news yet that the judge is writing the decision out, and as soon as they hear what that decision is, they will forward it. So we're sitting on pins and needles. Is the judgment gonna happen? Are they gonna get some settlement? Because if they do, that will be news. My opinion, if they don't, that's huge news that we should be trumpeting also, because they are due settlement. They've actually gone to the work to discover in their recorded documents all of the Doc X forgeries. I mean, they actually had were able to identify the 5,200-ish documents. It was around five or 6,000 documents. I don't remember the specific number right now. That had been sent to their office and recorded from Doc X. And they were, of course, um, forged signatures, robo-signing, false notarizations, fake beneficiaries, just like we've talked about. So this is a big issue, and I'm really hoping that they get some settlement. And, and, and I would hope that this would be another log to lay on the fire for stopping foreclosures. I did want to move into this today. This is the, we get some fascinating information from Catherine Austin Fitz. This is her Solari report, and I really didn't know the the background, her background. I just knew that she had been the director of FHA in the late 80s and then had been, you know, pushed out. But I didn't know why or anything about that. And what they're discussing today on this, she with John Rappaport, is the Hamilton Securities. And evidently, that was her company. And I would like to just brief you on what they're going what they're going to talk about and and the history of the Hamilton Securities Group because Catherine Austin Fitz founded the Hamilton Securities Group in 1990 so that would be right after FHA she went out and founded the Hamilton Securities Group and the firm was initially very successful 
and it was known for innovation in the application of new technology to financial transactions. However, their helping the FHA realize a 100% improvement in defaulted mortgage recoveries, you get that? She worked at FHA and said, you know something? If we had this technology, we could improve recovering our defaulted mortgages. So after the FHA term, she went out, made a company, put it together. It was terribly successful and unpopular. Huh? Unpopular with private investors and developers accustomed to special treatment. Hamilton's efforts stood in the way of the financial coup d'etat of engineering, are you listening, a mortgage bubble using federal mortgage fraud of disappearing billions from federal accounts and of a new wave of gentrification which would include the development of private prison companies financed with federal contracts. Wow. And this is in the 90s. In 1996, she had dinner with a politically connected HUD developer. He told her that a decision had been made to somebody else, high level, had made a decision to move Hamilton and Catherine Austin Fitz out of position. He said, well, we tried to have you fired through the White House, but that didn't work. So now the big boys, so let's think of who these big boys are, need I tell you, have gotten together and decided you're going to prison. Can you imagine going to dinner with somebody and being told that? It's just mind-boggling. However, she had organized Hamilton to withstand such dirty tricks, and she replied that the effort, if begun, would fail. I was too clean. He said, you don't get it, the fix is in. There's nothing you can do. He was wrong. There was a great deal she could do and did, but after 18 audits and investigations only turned up evidence of a great performance on behalf of taxpayers and communities and numerous efforts to falsify evidence to support bogus allegations failed, Hamilton was successful in civil litigation against the government. The process proved to her, and now to you and me now that we know about this, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we have no economic problems. Our problems are spiritual and political. As the developed world contemplates now, 15 years, 20 years later, trillions in unfunded liabilities and a growing mountain of debt, John and I, she invites us to explore what the story of Hamilton Securities says about the possibilities of rebuilding our power our culture, and our wealth as we clean up the mess by pumps and dumps and bubbles and bailouts. And so this is what they've talked about. Now, John has put together a special collection of Exiting the Matrix, and I wanted to share with you a couple of other links that I clicked on so now I know simply because I saw this today. This is The Myth of the Rule of Law, or How the Money Works, the Destruction of Hamilton Securities Group. And notice she wrote this in August 2002. So this was 13 years ago, and you and I are just hearing about it. And that's part of the problem. It's difficult to get the information the people need to know out. And this is what we work on every day. That's why I'm saying maybe one a day one a day. We need to just keep filling it up because look, 13 years ago, we didn't know. Now we know. What was so classic to me, and you can click on the links yourselves and read it. It's a, a very well written explanation, but I really wanted to click on how the money works, the destruction of neighborhoods. And then she goes into examples of, uh, you know, exactly like in Hudson, uh, Hardeman County, Tennessee, what ha actually happened. But this is the point, how they destroy the neighborhoods. 
This model works about the same in every county, although the particulars vary between domestic and inter, uh, in every country, well, in counties too, because it, it may vary between domestic and international agencies and the military and enforcement bureaucracies, but she said some call it the securitization process, uh, some call it corporatization, some call it privatization, some call it globalization. What it means in our terms is that the management of resources is centralized. This really rings true with me because as we've looked at the solutions, even before knowing this, it's been a local solution. You know, food in your backyard, local banking, uh, public banking in the county, at the state level, it's getting back to local control. Control who you elect in your own local um, elections and and changing the funding in your local state for for uh, running campaigns you know so the globalization gives the power to the elite but the localization gives the power to the people and so this is how they do it they they create a globalization uh, centralization through a system of securitization based on privilege and coercion rather than performance and the rule of law. So here I grew up my whole life, I'm sure you did too, and we thought it was all about do your job, do well, follow the rules, you'll succeed. And so from the viewpoint of the neighborhood, here's what they've been doing. So you can think about your neighborhood like I'm thinking about mine and saying, okay, where are we in this list? So the first thing they do is consolidate all retail sales into a few large corporations, including franchise operations, cutting out the local small business. In one of the examples, she cites that when Walmart went in, 30 small businesses went out of business. Not only then did that, you know, destroy those people and their jobs and their businesses, but it doesn't bring in any other people that understand how to run a business. It shoves that knowledge out of the local system and on, it just feeds wage slavedom. Secondly, you outsource or privatize all local, oops, <laughs> sorry, it, it jumped. I, <laughs> here, let's, uh, um, the destruction of the neighborhoods, here we go. Secondly, you outsource or privatize all local government functions to a few corporations. Or, or, now listen to this, sub subject them to such an overwhelming amount of federal regulation that they can be controlled and managed for the benefit of a few large corporations and their investors. So overload them with such regulation that they just can't move, and then the large corporations and investors can control them. Third, you buy up all the land and real estate, or encumber them with mortgages in a way that is as profitable as possible and allows you to get control when you want it. Now, does that sound familiar? That sounds really familiar to me. Now, fourth, and she brings this in and she makes a really good article, um, an argument for why she says this, that you can read, but they finance the entire process with profits from narcotics and organized crime that they market into the neighborhood. That enables the powers that be to finance your expansion in a manner that lowers your cost of capital in a way that conveniently lowers the initial price of your investment and or weakens your competition. So in other words, you and me, the people, when we have to go to the bank, we have to pay whatever the bank says. We want to borrow you know, to buy the house or build a business. These controllers get a lot of their money from some other source. So they can undercut, they can finance this purchase at a fraction of the cost and win. It's called deep pockets. We see that in retailing a lot, you know, a loss leader that the larger stores can afford to sell goods at a loss to drive another business out of business because that small business can't sell that much product at a loss or they go out of business. And so it's classic loss leader in what they're doing here. And so they'll take the money, and I think I showed a little video, I mean, I'm connecting back, this was a couple, three weeks ago, about how they built Florida on drug profits. 
that is the point you know all the high rises and everything it's it's the it's drug money and of course if you combine the drug money with the government like we've got the banks with the you you just have these cartels and so it really is about them versus all the people us and that includes people like Catherine Austin Fitz who had a very lucrative business lost millions and millions of dollars in this battle against the government they they don't care who they stomp as long as you it's us <laughs> They're not. They're doing the stomping, and then a fifth. You leverage all of this with tax shelters, private tax exempt bonds, municipal bonds, government guarantees, government subsidies, all protected with complex securities arrangements. Does that sound familiar? This we've we've seen this. Now we understand. And if that's the case, you know, this the the foreclosure, the mortgage securitization, all this information that we've been studying and fighting against and trying to figure out what are they doing and how can we fight back? It now starts to go click. This is just a cookie cutter clone. They just stomp around the the all the different business types all the interactions with the same cookie cutter. So truly, breaking the cookie cutter is what it's going to take, and the people then can take back control. And then, of course, six is how they're destroying the neighborhoods. They ensure that the only companies and mutual funds that are allowed meaningful access to capital are those run by the syndicate-approved management teams. To raise significant campaign funds, candidates for political office appoint syndicated approved management teams. Investment syndicates define the boundaries of managed competition that cycle all capital back through their pipelines. That means only local boys who can make good are those who play ball with the syndicate. In this way, the private equity in a community can be extracted at a near infinite rate of return to investors and a highly negative rate of return to the taxpayers. And it destroys the community in the process. Classic. Classic. This is why I've talked about we've got to open our eyes and we've got to understand that this is what they were doing. She's exposed it. It's right here for us to read and share. She... She makes it very, very plain with tons of information supporting this. So we no longer need to figure it out. We've figured it out. She's figured it out for us. This is the way it works everywhere. So now we can actually start to say, okay, what we need to do is connect with others. We need to connect with sources for honesty and truth and I really wanted to show you John's, she's, this is all came up about, about the little Solari email I got from her and about this discussion. I looked at this this morning going, oh my goodness, you've got to see this. And you need to see John's site. No more fake news. Because we're always looking for sources that we can trust. People that are not just weirdos but that actually can support and have documentation and evidence and are explaining where they've come from, what they've seen, what they've experienced. We know they're being honest with us. And so this is his news site. And you'll see, because what he's got right here on the front of the site is the his blog. And so you'll look at, like, the Boston bombing, citizen video analysts, creating major problems for the controlled media. This is a fabulous blog. I've sort of read it. And basically, he says, uh, he's sort of writing it as if he was a reporter for a major TV news outlet. And the problem with this is the... Um, here, I, I just need to read a couple of these, and then you can read them. I'm not going to read the whole thing. <laughs> but the fact is... As a TV reporter, news reporter, they've become aware of a disturbing trend. Thousands of private citizens are now analyzing video and photographs of crime scenes and posting their findings. They're hounds and they can't be stopped. And they're looking at news footage and casual video and photos. And what they're coming up with challenges the official storyline your network pushes. And I have to admit, that's happened to me. 
because there were some, you know, inconsistencies, like he said. For example, video footage of the first bomb in Boston doesn't appear to show any shrapnel damage to the fencing near the explosion or to the blue canopy just above the street. You, the reporter, you wonder about that too. And now you see a famous 78-year-old runner who fell down in the street, you know, just after the explosion. We've seen that over and over and over. Security personnel wearing yellow jackets were standing closer, but they didn't wobble or duck or waver. And the reporter wonders about that too. And so then the reporter sees a photo of a storefront, I saw this too, which was presumably right next to the first bomb and the windows are blown out, but all the glass is lying in the street, which would indicate that the explosion came from inside the building, not outside. So how is that possible? And he goes on to explain the inconsistencies that we now as citizen viewer reporters, researchers, are going, wait a minute, what? What is that? How? That's inconsistent. And I already now feel that this is a definitely, that's my personal opinion, that something else is going on here. What they're telling us is not the truth. And so I've been watching my daily newspaper to see what comes out. Are they going to sing the party line? Or are they going to start exposing, you know, these inconsistencies in the bombing? Where is every media at? And so this is one thing that you and I have to continue to do, I swear to God. And that is we have to continue to take pictures. We have to continue to question. And we have to continue to post these things and spread the word. We need to write letters to our editors saying, how come you're, how come you're quoting this media outlet party line with all of these inconsistencies. Why don't you start looking into these inconsistencies? Let's get our local papers, our local media outlets to start to talk about the inconsistencies of the party line. That's something else we can do and, and on any and every issue, whether it's the Boston bombing or whether it's a foreclosure, uh, the, the forged documents. In fact, someone just emailed me yesterday. I haven't had a chance to connect. I apologize. I'm busy. I'm frantic. I can only do, you know, so much work. But she is going to take her forged documents to Marin County Board of Supervisors next Tuesday and asked me to join her. So I'm thinking I probably will try to do that because I want to live stream these kinds of interactions. I want all of us to be able to share with each one of us that's fighting back whatever we're doing. If you're if you're able to write an article to challenging a um, a local uh, newspaper or a TV station about one of these um, storylines in the media, and and you're reported. You know, they will report on that or they will listen to you and give you, you know, even even 30 seconds. Let us know because we want to share that. That way we can get that news out. You know, I have a couple of links now in the live streams on uh, the past couple of weeks. Different news outlets that have talked about the, you know, the foreclosure fraud. And, and yet that's it. I don't have any more. So we need to get more. We need to build on what we've got. We need to spread those out. And so in his blogs... I'm thinking that this is going to give each one of us something to seriously consider. Take off our rose-colored glasses. He's talking, here's a blog that was just um, earlier this week. Reality is a psyop. In other words, we are living in the matrix. I don't know if you've watched the movie, but it's, it's a cla the concept is classic, and that is the people are dreaming, and their dreams are where they think they really are, but they're not. And I, I, the, that's, that's where we're at. We're living in a dream, but we can, we can get out of the dream and we can make changes in reality. So then, of course, he talks about how this effort in Boston, you know, shut the whole city down, emptied the streets, no flights, uh, doors were locked, massive police presence, stay inside. I showed you that those pictures yesterday. That was in Watertown, but they did it in Boston. Don't move, watch TV. Oh, and only listen to what we tell you to listen to. And only look at these people because nobody else counts. What kind of a comment is that? 
and 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 truly we need to just keep getting the the message out yeah here he, fbi tells america believe us don't believe anybody else and believe what we say believe these two guys oh we don't know who those guys are oh oops we've been talking to them for five years um this is this is the point and and as these these stories cannot be contained then we need to make sure that we push that pressure to break these stories apart that's one thing we can do so the fact of the matter is there's things we can do and we're doing it right now so i really appreciate your effort thanks for hanging in there sorry we had some evidently issues this morning with computers and and sound but we just keep pushing we're not going to quit we're not going to give up so thanks so much guys for joining the effort spread the word pick one person today that you're going to talk to about something and let's bugger the bankers the politicians and bureaucrats see you tomorrow